Good morning. Happy Sunday, everybody. Welcome to today's story. We have a lot to cover. I'm going to call this one today 50 Nuggets because that's how many pieces of information we're going to share and drop on you. So if you find three pieces of new learnings today, hit the like. That's the deal. Three, not one. So let's jump in and uh, talk about all the stuff, all the top questions of the week. And many of them coalesce around things like Ethereum, Emerge, and a whole bunch of other stuff, including one that took a lot of research and was quite interesting. So let's go again, go into the edutainment section, never financial advice. So first of all, before we go into the actual questions, I just want to share this from CZs because we will be talking about Binance at the end of the video. Um, but here, I thought this was very profound. Bitcoin first got to 20K five years ago. He's plus or minus three months there on that timing, but take round it up to five years. And today Bitcoin is exactly $20,007. It's bizarre. But the price does not erase all the development and the adoption over the past five years. Price is just a reflection of mass psychology, not progress. And Bitcoin will be here five years later and at a different price. So again, just want to open up with that. This is a crazy time. Who would have thought five years ago we'd be at the same price five years later? Because five years in the markets is a lot of time. So first question today is from Wally Pops. Where are you setting your mental stop loss in Ethereum if the merge goes terribly wrong, like all the Bitcoin maxis claim it will? Hmm, interesting. So first of all, uh, we've got to talk about my cost base is about 200 bucks. Um, I have not added it at all since early summer 2021. Didn't buy any ETH at all. Um, and I've been layering out all the time, and that means moving into different assets. But uh, the real magical question is, what does ETH look like compared to other stuff? And we will be talking more about ETH and Matic compared to Solana and what we think here as well. So if you look at this, this is the ETH to Solana pair. And it is actually down at the flip time again. This is the level at which I move some of my Ethereum into Solana. And I've been doing that gradually, basically ever since summer 2021. Um, even early, no, summer 2021 or September. Can't remember the exact time. That's when I started moving uh, from one asset to the other. And of course, sometimes changing back too, as you can see here in the chart. So that is my positioning. Now, in terms of stop loss, I think if ETH went under $1,000 again, I just get out. But again, I am kind of getting out as it is uh, in this regard. And we'll talk more about why next. So this question is from Big Mac. So do you see Polygon's ZK, which is Zero Knowledge EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine implementation, and Ethereum 2.0 as a risk to Solana? Unless I am mistaken, these will help the 200 pound gorilla scale and reduce costs. Yes, so I actually refer to Ethereum as the 800 pound gorilla. So it's four times bigger than your 200 pound. But let's jump into five rounds. And I want to thank the team behind the scenes for helping with this five round methodology. It's like a boxing match, which is really cool. So first of all, round one, let's talk transactions per second. The Polygon ZK EVM can take Ethereum's transaction per second up to 20,000. TPS, while well, Ethereum's merge can go up theoretically to maybe 100,000 transactions per second. But this has not been tested yet. These numbers are still unproven and theoretical. Now, Solana's proof of history has already been able to run at 50,000 TPS and theoretically has gone up to 700,000 TPS. But the real thing is actually it crapped out at 400,000 TPS last year when it got spammed to hell, but they're fixing that. So that may no, may no longer be a problem. But on top of that, Solana was built from the ground up as a proof of history, and its mainnet has nearly two years head start of ETH's proof of stake, which hasn't gotten off the ground yet. And you can bet there will be hiccups along the way for ETH as a proof of stake chain, whereas Solana now has two years more time to work out those kinks. So round one, in our opinion, goes to Solana. Ding, ding. Round two, fees. And remember, we just look at data. And we are as objective as possible. We're not pumping any bags. As you know, my Ethereum bag is a lot bigger than my Solana bag. So I should be saying nicer things about Ethereum than sometimes I do. Anyway, round two, fees. As you know, Solana is much less expensive and much less bloated than Ethereum. Ethereum's gas fees can run hundreds of dollars, 
where Solana's fees are in the fractions of pennies. That's why it gets spammed. It's very cheap to spam. Now, however, the merge Ethereum will become less deflationary and possibly even deflationary, we hope. And the issuance of Ether will decline by approximately 90%, as with the lower operation costs of validators, so on and so forth. And Polygon's ZK EVM is also set to reduce Ethereum fees by 90%. So round two is technically a tie, even though it will still be more expensive to transact on the Ethereum slash ZK EVM. It's getting closer. It's getting better. So we'll just give that a tie. Round three, technology. So Ethereum uses EVMs and it must maintain its state of distributed computer. And this data structure, which holds not only all accounts and balances, but also the state of the machine. And the state can change as more blocks get added to the chain. Now, Ethereum's protocol must keep continuous, uninterrupted, and immutable operation of the state machine computer, which gets heavy, bloated, etc. as we go on. And this is what's behind the smart contracts. Now, Polygon's EVM layer 2 scaling essentially snaps on nicely to Ethereum, and the EVM is designed to do what's called stateful architecture. Now, when we look at Solana's architecture, it is stateless. It only requires a sequence of computational steps to determine the time passage between two events cryptographically. Each node in the network doesn't keep a copy of the entire transaction history, but rather a validation of the transaction sequentially. So round three, in our opinion, goes to Solana. There's only five rounds, so two more left. It goes quick as it can. So round four, ecosystem. Ethereum has a vast ecosystem. I estimate it is over three times the size of the Solana ecosystem. That's like 3,000 dApps versus about 1,000 dApps. But since Ethereum was first a successful smart contract platform, it had a huge head start, nearly five years, over all other protocols in the smart contract space, the layer one space. And the majority and the most important DeFi dApps in the industry are currently built on Ethereum. That's Aave, Uniswap, MakerDAI, USDC, etc., and the leaders in the NFT space. Uh, it's getting close now, but things like OpenSea, Rarible, CryptoPunks, Decentraland, Sandbox. And Ethereum's long-term strategy is very favorable since its technology is not only disruptive, but also based on its platform with incredible growth potential and has the largest development community of all cryptos. So with that, Solana, however, is catching up in this aspect. Solana is still very nascent stage, has about a billion dollars in TVL, I think it's 1.4 something right now. And this is small compared to the 35 billion on Ethereum. And we'll see. So round four clearly goes to Ethereum. Let's go round five. Final thing, we kind of smashed two areas together for this one. One is daily active users, and two is breadth of the dApps. And Solana has uh, 266,987 daily active users. Polygon has 198,145. And Ethereum has 460,146, which fluctuates, and it's actually going down a little bit. Now, Solana has a broader breadth of dApps. So this is a tricky one. So think of two chains versus one, two ganging up in one. The average DAU between Polygon and Ethereum equates to approximately Solana. And therefore, since Solana has more flexibility, more versatility, and more breath adapts, I will give the edge to Solana, not being biased, just the facts. So here we are. In summary, the conclusion, uh, Solana wins TPS. Fees are a tie, even though Solana is still cheaper. Uh, technology, Solana, we believe is better, even though it has bugs, it's still in beta, etc., etc. Ecosystem, Ethereum has the edge, has been around much longer, has much more. And round number five, daily active users and breath adapts, slight edge. Therefore, Solana is the winner. But forget all that. That's not what I look at. Well, it's many stuff we look at a lot. But this is the million dollar question, ladies and gentlemen. So if you look at value hunting, so for example, I uncovered, you know, things like Tesla, uh, Google before they had big runs. And that's the key here. you got to get into stuff early before they have big runs. If you look at the relative value of this asset compared to others, let's just look at market caps. So if you combine the market cap of Ethereum and Matic, it is over 17 times larger than that of Solana. Does it do 17 times more? No. 
that's my thesis. So hope that answers your question. A <laughs> tough question, but again, it was interesting to bundle those two together and see how they stack up against Solana. Very different comparing apples to oranges. And it'll be interesting to see how this whole space shakes out. And remember, there's new entrants coming into the space too. So related to that is another question from Fracto Pat. This is thoughts on Solana and jump crypto fired answer. So in full disclosure, uh, I was not even aware of fired answer up until about a week ago. So Fire Dancer is a fully independent consensus node built by Jump Crypto for Solana. And Jump Crypto does a whole bunch of different stuff. In fact, they um, bailed out the worm bridge attack to the tune of about $300 million, if I recall. But basically, it's a new type of validator that will help Solana achieve consensus. And Fire Dancer's goal is to improve both the decentralization and performance of the Solana chain. And having a second consensus implementation through Fire Dancer improves decentralization with at least one third of a stake running Fire Dancer, where there will be no single client with a supermajority on the network. And this adds more resiliency to the ecosystem. And Fire Dancer also helps by making validation more accessible and reducing implementation risk. And this further will reduce the chance that exploits would have a, f a large effect on the actual proof of stake chain. And furthermore, it does add a second independent core development team, allowing for more decentralization among the developers to improve decentralization in the network governance. Overall, very promising, but still very early days yet. We have a lot to monitor as it goes forward, but net net more positives being layered on. So next question is from Rancher Rick. Will we need to upgrade, convert our ETH holdings to a new type of token when the merge occurs? Uh, or can we leave our current ETH ERC-20 tokens in our wallets? What about other ERC-20 tokens like Linkmatic, etc.? So excellent question. A lot of people have been concerned about this for a long time, ever since the whole talk of the merge happened. So first of all, the merge is simply joining the existing execution layer of Ethereum with its new proof of stake consensus layer, the beacon chain. And basically it transitions from mining to staking as the consensus mechanism. And the beacon chain was initially shipped separately from the Ethereum mainnet, but now the mainnet has all the accounts, balances, smart contracts, and blockchain state, etc. And the merge is basically switching off mining to utilize the beacon chain as the engine for block production. Okay, so mining will no longer produce valid blocks. Instead, proof of stake will, and the validators will, and this will take on this role and be responsible for validating all transactions on blocks. So net net, in answer to your question. All of the history of Ethereum will remain the same. That means as the mainnet gets merged, uh, so will the entire transactional history of Ethereum. And you don't need to do anything in your end. Your funds are safe and will continue on the new chain. And this is directly from the ethereum.org website. Uh, you can read it yourselves in your own time. But uh, there is one thing to be careful of is scams. If you do not see anything that is telling you to deposit your ETH in order, like upgrade to ETH2, do not do it. It's a scam. OK, you do not need to do anything to convert your ETH for the merge or any other assets. So just be very, very wary of that. A lot of people are preying on this insecurity right now. So <laughs> that's probably the most important thing we said today. But there's more coming. So next question is from Zach. Um, what do you think it will take before blockchain is used at scale by companies like Oracle, Amazon, Microsoft? And will we ever talk about multi-chain like people do about multi-cloud today? Interesting question. So it's a tough one because it goes in two separate directions. First of all, uh, big tech is investing heavily in blockchain. Uh, Google invested one and a half billion in the last year in four big uh, projects. I think Fireblocks, Dapper Labs, Voltage and Digital Currency Group. Uh, the DCG stuff probably got hit a little bit. Also, the number two player, just for interest sake, I think it was BlackRock with about 1.2 billion invested in Circle, FTX, Anchorage Digital, and so far. So there are uh, big tech players, but I always want to highlight BlackRock and how big they're investing in this space. Now, first of all, in terms of blockchain use as a technology for tech companies to provide their services, short answer is probably not. But uh, one of the issues with these technology companies is they need to control the IP and make sure things are very, very secure. And this may not, at this stage of maturity, fit with their business models. Blockchain at its core is an immutable decentralized database. And this property is important for running a financial system, 
because you don't want the data to be easily altered and you don't want it to be controlled by a single entity. And companies like Oracle, Amazon, Microsoft, most likely don't have much of a use case for such a database. Not only is it a threat, but it also cannot be fully controlled, which is what they like to do on behalf of their customers. Um, these companies are typically fully centralized and have no need for their own decentralized properties, blockchains. But there's another thing to hint at on this as well. First of all, just on a side note, because we were talking about Ethereum, this is how much of Ethereum runs on AWS. And overall, the combination of all those logos below, 57%. So 25% runs of Ethereum, Ethereum runs on AWS. And the total combined of how much is hosted across all these different companies is 57%. So this is super interesting. Players like Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, etc., all have blockchain services that are used to run nodes. And uh, this, uh, some people frown upon. I mean, how can it be centralized when it runs on these different centralized companies? Well, that's just the nature of the beast. So the one thing that I do believe, though, is very important to stress is the disruption of traditional finance. And with that, I do believe blockchain will be used by big tech companies to disrupt TradFi. So look at Google Pay, Apple Pay, Square, etc. It's very clear where they are targeting. They're targeting what makes up 20% of GDP, maybe even more if you add on insurance. They all want to go after the TradFi market, and blockchain has the ability to make it radically more effective and efficient. And I believe the future of banking and financial services and TradFi will come from big tech, not from the Wells Fargo's, Bank of America's, the UBS's, etc. of the world, they are sitting ducks. They have too much legacy infrastructure. Infrastructure. They're kind of like ice car manufacturers. They can't get out of their own way. And that's where I believe the disruption will actually come from big tech and it'll be blockchain based. So sorry for that bifurcated answer, but that's the view of the world as of today. So next question is, this one is a fascinating one. And uh, it took a lot of work to get the answer for this. Sorry about that. It's a big session, so it's two coffee day. Well, two different types of coffee. So first of all, how will Biden losing control of the Senate, and maybe Congress, likely affect the US monetary policy and macro picture over the next two years from crypto trillion Whew. So we had to dig into a whole couple of things. But first of all, I think what you're getting out of here is losing control means uh, they call it a lame duck session when Congress and Senate have the inability to pass through uh, any meaningful legislation. And that's why I think things like the current Democrats in power in the United States are shoehorning a whole bunch of stuff through because they know come November, they're not going to be able to do anything. So they want to kind of leave their legacy now. And that's why they're putting all these programs together. And again, I'm not a political animal. I look at data. I don't care about anything else. So all of this stuff is data. I don't care if it's political data or GOP data or democratic data, or left or right or whatever. It's just data. So I don't want to offend anybody here. So first of all, this is the history of... 1967 to 2012, 45 years of the lame duck periods. And I broke it kind of pre-2012 and post-2020 because they are a little bit different. So again, if you look at a couple of things like the, there is sometimes a positive effect of political connections on the stock market and sometimes there is not. And sometimes as well, additional tests suggest that the diminishing political effect in the lame duck period is more pronounced during Republican presidencies. And this is important. Now, as I see it, if you take control away from the Democrats, the stock market likes it and does better during lame duck sessions. As I believe, let the markets run themselves, let them be free. Now, with the Republicans, when they are lame duck, the stock market actually falls. So the data for this period is stocks go up, when the Democrats are lame three times out of three times over the past 45 years, and stocks go down when the GOP is lame two out of three times. Well, it's really two and a half times because one is flat. It didn't actually go down or up. So that is that piece of history, but there's more. So this one is the 2000s, and stocks do gain in lame duck sessions. And the S&P 500 has posted gains in six of the nine lame duck sessions going back to 2000. And I think... Um, 
I can't remember who who it is, but many people believe that government should just get out of the way and markets perform better by themselves without crazy money printing, etc., which we'll talk about later too. So first of all, I broke down some history as well of the uh, when I, digging into the lame duck stuff, it made me uncover a whole bunch of other history. Is which presidents, which parties uh, have the best S and P five hundred returns since nineteen forty five? And uh, during this, you can see here very quickly. I'll break it into a gra graphic because it's easier to read. Here are the presidents. I marked the Democrats in blue and the Republicans in red, and the relative returns. Basically, what you see here only twice in the last since 1947 or whatever, have has a president been in office and the stock market gone down? Again, I always say stock market is number go up technology. It just goes up because the fiat goes down. So therefore, you know, it's expensive to be out of the market. But the lame duck, uh, it, it, the lame duck breakout, as I said, it does better for Democrats, but Democrats overall do better. And that made me ask the question, how does this all stack up? Obviously, you can eyeball the chart here and you can see well, the blues are bigger than the reds, and the blues have no negative returns, and the reds have a couple, but this is the breakdown of all the summary of the data. So the median return for a president when Democratic for the S&P 500 is 67% since 1947, and the median return when a Republican is in, in the office is 48%. So the Democrats do better, or at least the stock markets do better when a Democrat's in the office. Now, the total years analyzed is 36 years for Democrats in office, Republicans 40%. So the Republicans have been in office more, one full term more than the Democrats over this period. And the average return for Democrats is 55% higher than the GOP. So this kind of goes a little bit fly in the face to the fact that lame duck Democratic presidents have better stock market returns than uh, GOP presidents. So We'll see. See where this goes. Anyway, that was very interesting. Now, in terms of sorry for the long words, there's a lot of data behind this. There will be, I believe, after they lose their power, there will be no more trillion dollar programs. I'm going to use some aggressive language here: the Inflation Causation Act, my new name for the IRA, and the UBI Debt Act. No need to talk more about that. I know it's very political. That's all I'll say. But debt will continue to grow because we're beyond 77 percent debt to GDP ratio. The GDP will return positive in 2023, I believe, or earlier, depending on what happens and how the Fed reacts. Will they kick us into financial Armageddon or were they jawboning us on Friday? We will see. It'll be interesting. And stocks will go up as long as they are. Number go up technology, as I said before, I made multiple videos on that. And the interest rates will fall back down to 2% or lower sometime in 2023, 2024. That's my prognosis. So <laughs> we'll see if I'm right. The internet doesn't lie and this old stuff will be a record. So next question, Chewbacca Moon. I've been sitting on $400,000 cash because I want to buy more real estate in three to nine months. What do you think of this instead of deploying it into stocks and crypto? So you're sitting on cash right now. And of course, because I don't do financial advice, I can't tell you what to do, but I will share some information. So first of all, with real estate, Watch the 30-year because that has a big impact on price. It is spiking again, and the demand for mortgages is the lowest in 21 years. Obviously, with the news out of Friday, the I believe next week, the mortgage rates will probably go a little bit higher as we go forward. Now, let's look at new home sales. They are tanking, and they are tanking hard, and this is just beginning. We are halfway through the real estate correction. 10% down, another 10% to go, as I've said before. And the home affordability is the lowest since 1989. This is from Charlie Bellello, and that is a pre pretty staggering statistic unto itself. Now, let's talk about sniping time for real estate. Uh, historically, my sniping time has always been between November 26th and January 15th, 2023. I'm a creature of habit, and I follow that. The November 26th is 2022. Sorry, I forgot to add that. And there will be a six-month lag between the first... June 16, June 18, stock market crash and the full dip to the real estate market, which will take us to, say, December timeframe. And we're halfway there already. And there will also be a line with my typical shopping time, which is that November 26th to January 15th, the best time to buy because you have desperate sellers who are highly motivated to sell and nobody's buying because they're planning for Christmas or Thanksgiving or vacations or all sorts of stuff, kind of like August. So also, fourth quarter is always the best for stocks, as we know. 
far outperforms all the other quarters. People say, you know, September sucks, but then October, November, December tend to be very good. But if August sucks, September may not suck that much. Very important to remember. So the game plan, the way I see it, I'll just share with you some arrows of how I view the world. And this is not financial advice, but I believe stocks and crypto in Q4 will probably rise, probably rise quite a bit. And the real estate in the US will probably fall another 10% and in many other markets around the world, especially China, um, parts of Europe because of other problems there. And I have observed this over 50 years of data and it works 80% of the time. Then the stock market will dip a little bit in January. And then the real estate market will start rising in February, March, springtime. You know, humans are like animals. They like to nest. So springtime is hot for real estate. Unless, of course, the financial markets are crushed. So that is the game plan. Um, that's what uh, you need to look at and time where you invest. But of course, don't blow your nest egg to buy property speculating on very risky assets by the safe, safe assets. We'll talk more about some of the safe assets in a minute too. So next question is from Walkachu. I know you grow investments to put a third of your net worth into real estate. If you were just starting out and didn't own any real estate, would you still be 80% Tesla? Interesting question. So first of all, when I started out, I had a bicycle and a suitcase. I had nothing else. Um, so here we are. Clarification, the 80% is from my equity allocation and my allocation is in thirds. So if you imagine this is $100,000, it'd be $33,000 in each pie, $33,000 in uh, the equity of real estate, not the value of the real estate, the amount that you own in real estate. For example, if you have an 80% low mortgage, 20% is your equity and the property is a million dollars, that's 200,000. That's how that would uh, work out there. So 80% is also too high for concentration in any one stock. But my problem is Tesla has just exploded and it's grown to be that high. It wasn't the original plan, but again, once you get on a fast horse, just keep riding it unless your thesis changes. Remember that everybody. And I'm not selling Tesla, I'm just adding. And I've been adding as well over the last uh, couple of months. So stacking, I buy leaps and I wait. <laughs> I wait a couple of years for them to perform. And I also buy leaps before stock splits, especially. So this is that. Now, in terms of what I would do, if I had no real estate, I would save up for some real estate. Everybody needs a castle. You've heard this before. And I'd probably use the following chart of which maximum 50% of my equity would be Tesla. So if you have $100,000, um, half in crypto, half in equities, half of the equities would be Tesla maybe. So that'd be 25%, not financial advice, just what I would do. And then the crypto would be very, very safe crypto assets, not speculative ones by no stretch. So hope that helps you. Next question is from Misa. Thoughts on Binance and their bill and their stability right now. So this is an interesting question. I've been reflecting a lot about Binance too, especially after all that has happened in the first in Q2 of 2022. And back in, I think it was May 2021, I put together my usual mind map, how I process all my thoughts. Uh, this was in May 2021, and it has lots of red flags, lots of regulatory flags, lots of investigations, lots of frustrated customers. And I do believe uh, Binance in this history has become much more uh, customer friendly, regulatory friendly, really working on cleaning up their act. In addition, there is no doubt in terms of pros and cons, this is USA only because I did have a Binance USA account. They do have the lowest fees compared to other exchanges. Uh, they have discounts. They have very good educational resources. They have got a very good identity verification process. In fact, it's so good that it's sometimes really hard for some people to do their KYC which is the know your customer hurdles. Uh, they have some tax uh, portal that really helps with uh, crypto taxes too. The cons is in the US and not available in all states, maybe not in all countries. There is a minimum trade amount. Uh, the site, some people find difficult to use. Lack of information on security, a history of regulatory scrutiny, which kind of turned me off of them back in May. And limited customer service options, kind of like Coinbase. <laughs> so forget picking up the phone and finding somebody. So that's that. Now, it is the top exchange by far. It does way more spot volume than anybody else. 
And now they have the new uh, commission-free Bitcoin trading too. And I think they're adding Ethereum, if I'm not mistaken. So from that perspective, it's definitely very, very good. And they are the 800-pound gorilla. FTX is growing very fast. Um, and finally, probably the most important thing is uh, CZ. I, I do follow him and my respect for him has grown, especially through this crypto winter a lot. And he recently tweeted this. He said, reputation is the most valuable asset. And that resonated with me a lot. So kudos to CZ. We opened with CD, CZ as well at the very beginning with his Bitcoin price from five years ago today. So I think uh, Binance is definitely a safer play than I believed it was back in May. So no problem there at all. Next question is the real SHIB. Suppose fiat money went away and is replaced by a deflationary asset such as Bitcoin or Ethereum. How will banks conduct lending since interest needs to come from somewhere? So interesting question. So here, the short answer is they wouldn't replace. Uh, they wouldn't because they wouldn't need to exist. If the fiat system went away and was replaced by Bitcoin, then technically you wouldn't need banks. And instead of banks doing lending, it would be DeFi that would take this role over. And banks are intermediaries that facilitate lending and borrowing, but DeFi cuts out these middlemen, which makes it much cheaper and easier to take out loans, provide insurance and finance projects. Now, a DeFi system is also open to everyone and you cannot be locked out if your credit score is bad or your age, race, nationality, your political ideology, your location, etc. Anyone that has an internet can engage with it. And that is why it is so threatening to TradFi, as I mentioned at the beginning. And the majority of people in the world don't have bank accounts, which is very sad. And they are effectively locked out of the financial system. However, DeFi is the magic bullet and anyone can fund initiatives that they care about or provide loans to people across the world. And finally, it's not like we don't have lending before the fiat system. For much of history, money was gold or was backed by gold. Until it wasn't after Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. We mentioned Nixon earlier today as well. He had one of the red S&P 500. I think the stock market fell 40% under his reign. So uh, the financial system becomes dependent from debt, hopefully. And we had lending and borrowing way before our current fiat system. And we will continue to have it after. So no concerns there at all. And the favorite part of the week, and a big thank you every for the super chats and everybody else. Um, let me get this right. So we have Harley, who is a grivet. He loves to play in the kiddie pool and grab fru frozen fruits. I actually like frozen blueberries myself. So Harley and I will get along very well, unless he steals all my berries. And Skeeter, he's a pigtail mukak. Um, and previous owners got him addicted to TV. And now he's in a sanctuary eating healthy and exercising and playing outside. And I hope he doesn't need glasses. Too much TV is bad. Too much screen time is bad as well. So <laughs> make sure you limit it all. So with that, everybody, I hope you enjoyed the KPM. A lot of information here. And uh, hit the like if you learned at least three things that are very new. And with that, I'm going to go to some questions. We have over 3,000 people watching live. So appreciate every single one of you and all the moderators in the chat and everybody else. So this is the fun part. Where people throw questions at me <laughs> live. So this is going to be interesting. And again, let's jump in. Future Millionaire, currently down 50% on GBTC. Saw your video on pros and cons to GBTC. Should I pull out now and buy Bitcoin or hold for the long term? Um, again, I think when I put that together, I don't even remember when, probably last weekend, I did the whole EV model and mapped out the risk. I think selling now at a 30% discount and buying Bitcoin, unless you have plans to really get off the grid and run to another country or somewhere, I, I wouldn't worry about it. I'd stick with GBTC. That's what I personally would do. My goals are not your goals. So, uh, but yeah, you're going to like, I think the cost of big, one whole Bitcoin on GBTC is like 12,500 now versus 20,000 for Bitcoin. So it's a, uh, it's a lot more expensive to buy um, Bitcoin that way. So Mr. Chili's, in opinion on which country will experience the most favorable outcome of a worldwide economic crisis strikes? US, South Korea, Australia, China. Um, most favorable outcome, worldwide economic crisis strikes. Uh, well, not a strike, not a labor strike, but an overall crisis. So 
right now, what we've learned, at least from my perspective, is the importance of energy dependence. I think those countries that are energy dependent carry all the cards. So in that case, it's like places like Russia, United States, they are kind of less impacted. I'm really concerned about our friends in Europe that are now being held over a barrel by our friend Putin. Not our friend, of course. Um, so that is kind of a, a strange situation. Um, South Korea is too close to some hot areas, and also they're very dependent on imports and energy and stuff. Australia, uh, <laughs> they, they've they been self-sufficient for so long and they have so many natural resources, I think they'll be just fine. And China has its own set of very complex issues right now. Uh, negative birth rate, not enough people to grow. Um, I can't remember the forecast, but the Chinese population is forecasted to fall about 20% over the next 30 years um, because of some of the policies they've had. So that is a bit of a problem. So I think... Literally, also going back over the last 18 years, the U.S. stock market has outperformed all of the stock markets by far. So with that, I think if I had to pick one, it would be the U.S. would be the one that can weather the worst global economic crisis. Um, one Brightum, uh, in your best guesstimate, where do you see Saul Bottom now? So uh, in full disclosure, I bought it on Friday when it went to 32, I think, and I think it's about 32 now. Uh, you know, if if the poop hits the fan next week, it could go as low as, I think it fell to 26, 27 during the worst of the down market. Uh, it tends to be very correlated to Ethereum. So um, Ethereum tanks, Bitcoin tanks, it could go down back to that 26 level. But right now it's holding up very strong above the 30 level. Um, and the question is, what happens next week? So my anticipation is perhaps, now if, you know, I'm, I'm a person on the internet. I, I make guesses and I put my money where my mouth is. Um, and I'm not always right. Nobody is always right. But it's, more, it's most important to be right most of the time. So I think Monday could be rough. And then the market will absorb the news from Friday and start doing some calculations and things will wash through the system and the stock market will return back up again. Uh, I don't think we're going to go back to a double bottom of like 3,500 in the S&P, S&P 500. We could, um, if some other shoe drops, if some bad news hits in September, we could fall down again. But I think uh, it'll be gradually chasing up again and People will front run the Q4 action, like I mentioned earlier. All these questions are connected. It's great. Because um, you don't want to be late to get on the train and be stuck at the very back in this crappy seat by the toilet. So that's what I think could happen. Uh, Long-term holder, how are you, buddy? Um, thoughts on backwardation? Bitcoin, as noted by Will Clemente, commenting in the future Bitcoin price, showing more bets to the downside. It's very mixed. It depends on the time frame. And I look at this a lot. The Bitcoin bets are north of 25K for the end of September for Bitcoin. The short-term stuff over the next couple of days, week or so, is very mixed. When you have an event like Friday, you have everybody going bearish, everybody placing bearish puts. But normally, sometimes placing those bearish puts after the news is out, you're already too late. You always have to be in your position before the crud hits the fan, as they say. So uh, from that perspective, yes, I did notice that there was a premium on downside bets. And, uh, but you know, where could we go? Like the, the, the level, when I look at Bitcoin over the last two days, the, uh, I call it magnet ball. The magnet ball, like where it kind of just sticks to, the 20,000 level is staggering. It is like literally, every time it dips a little bit below, say, 197, it gets bought up. Then it goes to 20,200. It gets sold off. Then it goes back to 197, gets bought up. 20,300. It's just people are just trading the range all day long. And again, there's also very low volume. It's August. We'll see what happens. But one final thing I will say, and that's been the telltale. If Bitcoin rallies when China opens, Asian markets open, the stock market could open strong tomorrow morning. Watch it here. So I make a lot of... Uh, I say everything that I think, I could be wrong. But uh, I think there's a 60% chance Bitcoin could be snagged up by some big buyers tonight. 
and it could be strong and that could lend itself to a strong stock market open tomorrow. Again, just thinking out loud, but uh, not too concerned. Um, again, you got to look at the 30 day out uh, option pricing and that's where the action is going to go. Dog one, happy weekend to all. Would love to hear about pair trading is <laughs> like sailing. Uh, seems like an apt metaphor. Thanks to the KPM. It's an interesting one. I've I've sailed for 45 years. Um, and I've sailed everything, pretty much everywhere. So that is a fascinating one. Um, one of the things that would be a parallel to sailing would be tacking, you know, going on to port or starboard, depending on where you are, depending what your direction is and where you think the wind is going to go, where the tide is going to go, where the wind is in some cases. That would be interesting. So you could, the analog to that would be going long, going short, you know, bullish, bearish. So maybe going left is bearish, going right is bullish. I like that one. Let me think about that one and see if we did. MT, appreciate you, sir. Java, as always, best community on YouTube. Let's smash that like. It's because of people like you, Java, big love. And Bombiggy, uh, you are the man, as always. Um, Hello, my good friends. I cannot chat, but miss all of you. James Team Kip up. Great work. Thank you, Bomb Biggie. You're amazing. Matt C, do you think uh, Layer 2s like Matic and Optimism will continue to play a pivotal role post-ETH merge? And if so, why? Thank you from the animals. Yes, Matt C, that's a very simple question. You look at TPS. So ETH craps out at 15 TPS pre-merge. Post-merge, it'll do 20. 20 TPS won't get you anywhere. So if you if you think about blockchain for the future, you got to run at a million TPS. If your chain doesn't have a roadmap to a million TPS, they won't exist in three to four or five years. Look at the adoption. Look at the people coming in. And if there isn't a chain strong enough to support that level of transactions per second, <laughs> you're gone. And you also, for a blockchain to run something like a stock market, you got to run at a million TPS too. Yeah, or run something like a, a credit card network you know, massive, massive transaction volume. So from that perspective, Ethereum, the lifeblood of Ethereum is Matic and zero knowledge uh, rollups. Um, layer two screening is absolutely critical. And that's why actually in the previous session, we spent so much talking about the actual technology behind and why a certain name that will remain nameless is uh, as a unique technology to solve that. IROC 007. Uh, how can anyone be bullish on a chain where max supply can be changed? Uh, e Sol, Dot, Cosmos, Tezos, etc. Wouldn't lack scarcity negate adoption? Also, let me answer that first question first because I'll forget the second one. Um, think of uh, the like Ethereum has no max cap, uh, Tezos, Cosmos, Polkadot, etc. Because they assume and they built it from the ground up if it does take off and if it is widely adopted, it needs to grow into that adoption, okay? And if you look at, like ETH is a very good example, you know, many people expected September 2021 that EIP 1559 would make Ethereum deflationary. Well, that never happened. Uh, and so that's one of the things. And that's also one of the reasons I rock is why I love Bitcoin is because it is capped. And in fact, it is deflationary because people lose their keys all the time. Especially now, can you imagine all the people that have gone to self-custody and they don't have good OPSEC? They're losing their stuff left, right and center. So with that, um, if you are on a, on a chain that is growing uh, really fast, and just exploding and uh, is on a path to say a billion users, I am not concerned about the actual supply, the max supply. If it's a chain that's just a ghost chain, I would be very concerned. And that's why inflation doesn't matter when growth exceeds. Take, take the US government, uh, imagine GDP is growing at 20% and inflation is growing at 15%. That doesn't matter. But if GDP is minus 1% and inflation's 8%, that's a real problem. So there's another, it's not a direct analog, but just a way to think about it too. Jabba, uh, <laughs> this is for our monkey friends. Thank you so much again. You're so kind. And a big thank you to, uh, for the people with the stickers. St. Jude needs us, a bottle of red, Jeff Hammer, a long-term holder, uh, Bert Dartmoor, KN, Gooby, P. Dot, Artem, Stephen Chickering, Tanya Anderson, and Fast Timmy. You guys are all amazing. Uh, really appreciate each and every one of you and the mods in the chat. And this community is amazing. I love doing this every single day for you all. So thank you all. See you all tomorrow.